So I'm Zaria, uh, and I'm an experiment. Ooh. No, very ordinary, middle class, middle aged, Lewisham white lady. I'm a parent. I li I've lived in Lewisham about 10 years. I go to normal facilities like everybody else, the sports centre, the shops. My daughter's in the local school. So in what way am I an experiment? Well, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. So um, I came back to Lewisham about 10 years ago, having worked in rural China, very long way away. Uh, I went as a, a personal challenge. I wanted to push my own boundaries. I wanted to learn about the rest of the world and learn about myself as well. And it was indeed quite a challenging experience. Most of the people there had never seen a foreigner before. They'd only ever seen Chinese people. So they pointed and stared at me as a very extreme ethnic minority. <laughs> um, the, the I was a teacher, so I was teacher training. Uh, the position of teachers is very respected, but it also means you lose your privacy and that pupils expect to come round to your house at 7 p.m. any day and get help with their homework. <laughs> um, I witnessed um, animals being butchered in plain sight in public. That was quite a shock. I witnessed the treatment of nature, which I'd never seen before as well. For example, the tops were cut off mountains so that aircraft could land. Yeah. So um, it, it was an incredibly fulfilling, if challenging, experience. But imagine my shock then when I came back um, in 2020, middle of the pandemic, and there was a massive flood in southern China. 63 million people were affected, including two of my former students who, who have not been found. Um, it was very shocking to me that a place where I'd had such connection was effectively destroyed. Um, it, and it was a massive, massive flood. It, it covered the whole of southern China. And it's not been the only flood. There have been other floods. Germany last year, there have been floods in this country. Now, what are all these floods about? Why so many floods? They are unusual, right? So a bit more context. This is the first portrait ever taken of our planet. It was taken in 1963 through the window of um, the Apollo, uh, Apollo 8 uh, spacecraft. Um, and it was the first time that people had ever seen a picture of our planet, our beautiful, precious planet. Now, I'm going to start uh, <laughs> waxing on like Attenborough here. <laughs> but it's, um, our planet is amazingly biodiverse. It has a richness of nature that is beyond... It's not just ants, eh? <laughs> Uh, if you've ever watched an Attenborough program, you will know just how incredibly sophisticated the scientific basis and the, and the spiritual basis of our nature of our planet actually is. It's phenomenal, and we are products of it as the incredibly sophisticated humans. And I don't know about you, but I feel like a sophisticated human. <laughs> <laughs> so this is made possible by um, a layer of gaseous uh, uh, an atmosphere around the Earth which is very, very finely tuned. And it makes, they make us, uh, it makes us uh, called the, the Goldilocks planet. So not too hot and not too cold. There is a global biological balance. Now, our problem now with these floods is that there is too much carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And this is causing problems. So I've got a graph. So you can see over here, 1880, this is the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. So CO2 uh, in atmospheric composition terms is measured in parts per million. So at that point, it was about 280 parts per million. And this is thought to be the pre-industrial level, if you want the natural level. Now, previously to that, it had gone up and down, but generally, it's, this is a kind of normal level. So if we move on a bit, 1960, we've gone up a bit, and the black line underneath, can you, that is the um, overall temperature variance of the globe. So as you can see, it's going up and down, but overall, it's going up. So here we are getting on to about 1990, and now it's at 350 parts per million, um, which is thought to be a safe level. This is scientifically decided. This is a safe level beyond which the balance of the atmosphere is, dis is, is brought out of, out of kilter. But now, um, you can see where this is going, can't you? 2022. <coughs> We are at 418 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So we are well beyond our safe level. And this is um, difficult to perceive because we can't see it. 
because it's so big. Scientists tell us this stuff, but how do they know? How, do, how, how did they know what was in the air in 1880? That's quite strange, isn't it? This is how they know. This is fascinating. So they get the ice cores up from the depths uh, of the ice under the Antarctic, and they look at the air bubbles um, that are frozen into the ice, and they analyze that for the atmospheric composition. So it's ancient air that's frozen and then brought up. Now, the, <laughs> the, ice, the ice is melting pretty quick these days, so they're having to do this quite quickly. If anybody thinks that floods are something that happens a long way away in other countries, distant places, and won't affect us, this is where we are now. This is the flood map of London, of this area. So we are just off. If you see the blue area, we're just in Goldsmiths, slightly off the edge of that. <coughs> Safe. <laughs> um, this is from the government. So this is what they think will happen. Now, this is really difficult stuff to come to terms with. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? What can we do? Who is going to get us out of this? Yeah? Who's responsible? This is a global problem. Now, you could look to global political leadership. Politicians are supposed to take care of us, make everything all right, right? <laughs> so there has been um, the COP process. COP26 was in Glasgow last year. You might have seen it on the news. And reportedly, Boris Johnson fell asleep. Um, so <laughs> it was fairly disappointing in terms of outcomes. It means different countries need to negotiate, and that's incredibly difficult. And likewise, the previous 25 COPs have all been more or less disappointing. It seems that this is not going to help. I don't know what COP27 is going to bring. We're not very hopeful. You might look to possibly business leadership, to global corporations who show a lot of dynamism, innovation, technology development. Um, a lot of, uh, arguably, a lot of them are more powerful than governments in the terms of reach they have an actual political power as well, control power. But in fact, they are much too invested to uh, be able to make much of a change and ultimately, the CO2 level is still going up. It's not going down at all. It really isn't. It's just going to keep going up for the time being. So um, I don't think that global corporations and capitalism is really going to be a way out of this problem. Now, the thing is that CO2 is raised through the burning of fossil fuels. Now, probably know what fossil fuels are. Coal, oil, and gas, it is actually the resource base of our entire global economy. Our entire societies our manufacturing, our transport, a globalized uh, culture in general resting on the use of these three fossil fuels. And that is what, the burning of those is what creates raised uh, carbon dioxide. So we need to move away from, moving, from using coal, uh, oil, coal, and gas in a huge way. And the level of transformation needed across the world is absolutely phenomenal. It's almost unthinkably big. So what I think is actually that these large corporations and large systems are not what is needed to address a large problem. Actually, you need to bring the leadership down. And actually, this is what has happened, that there's much more leadership across the globe on, on a local level. So we live in Lewisham. Now, Lewisham declared a climate emergency in 2019. Hey, woohoo! Yay! <laughs> the first thing they did was to measure how much CO2 is being generated by Lewisham as a borough. 300,000 people, including most of us, and this is it. This is where it all comes from. So I'll give you a minute to read all this. I know there's a lot of text on it, but you can see about half of it is from our homes. So it's our heating, our bubble baths and showers, our using electrical things, but it's the things we do every day, all of us, using fossil fuels, petrol in particular, dependency on energy, obviously it's uh, power stations that are elsewhere, but this is what we, and this is not counting actually things like our food or um, things that we buy or from Amazon that get shipped in from China that we, that we might buy online, this kind of thing. Uh, so Lewisham Council decided to put a very ambitious target on reducing the whole borough to net zero. So bringing this all down to zero by 2030, eight years. And the eye-watering cost of this is thought to be 1.6 billion pounds. And that is a conservative estimate, apparently. There was once a great man who said, I have a dream. You know this speech, right? Notably, he did not say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. 
So I'm going to take a leaf out of his book and say, I've got a few dreams too, and I'm going to share my dreams, okay? I have a dream that when we wake up in Lewisham every day, wherever we live, we can hear birdsong because there are mature trees and rich biodiversity all over the borough in every place, and there are fewer cars, cleaner air, and more peace. I have a dream that in Lewisham, every bite that we eat is fresh food, fresh because it's been grown within a couple of miles, that maybe 24 hours before it's on your plate, it's been in the ground or on a tree. Imagine how healthy that would be, much, much healthier than food bought from the supermarket or shipped from all over the world. I have a dream that we wouldn't have enormous fuel bills that are a financial worry to so many people. We would have low fuel bills and we would all have warm homes because the energy for our homes would be managed locally. When we did pay our fuel bills, we would know that our money was going to one of our neighbours who worked for a local heat network, making sure that heat comes at a low cost and sustainably to everybody's homes. So nobody is cold in their home and the cost is not exorbitant. So having had all these dreams, <laughs> there are more dreams. Um, I decided uh, to set up a community group, Climate Action Lewisham, and here we are. <laughs> Yay! So, crucially about our group, we are just ordinary citizens. We are all people who live in Lewisham. Uh, we, like myself, we, we use the local amenities. We are part of the community. We are from the community. We are not part of any other wider organisation. Uh, we're not affiliated to larger NGOs. We're not elected. We're not funded, not very much anyway, and um, we fundraise ourselves. So we have no agenda other than trying to support and help the community to move towards less dependency on fossil fuel ways of living, to try and change our culture. Um, we um, use, we, we do stuff, we, we lobby the council quite a lot, because although we think they're fab for this, we have to keep them doing it. <laughs> um, we lobby about uh, mature trees, and we also say, um, seeing is believing. So the idea is that if you can see a low carbon alternative in your lifestyle, you're much more likely to be able to consider doing it, or even possibly take steps towards changing your own behavior and your own life and, ch and adopting it. So this is, um, we run Lewisham Family Cycling Library. So the idea is lots of people get cars because they have children, because they think that's the best way, the safest and most um, effective way to move their children around. Massive traffic jams. You have seen the traffic jams, right? So um, we have a, an electric uh, cargo trike, which has uh, charged seats in it. This will effectively hold four children. So this is obviously uh, a way to help people think about not using cars, but also going around on the streets, a way to show to people who may be in cars that this is possible, that this is okay, that this will work, you know? Um, we also lobby to save trees. Uh, we are not happy about the numbers of mature trees that are felled in Lewisham because they support so much biodiversity and singing birds, etc. This is quite difficult because the law does not necessarily protect ma mature trees. So we are trying to work around this, but we do do a bit of protesting about trees. Um, we do other things as well. Um, we try to make global issues uh, local level and make them how they relate and are important to people's local, local lives. So, for example, we held an event in the, in the pandemic called um, Eyes on the Skies because in the pandemic all the flights stopped and we suddenly had quiet over our heads, which was actually really nice, wasn't it? Do you remember? Now, in Lucian, we happen to be on three different flight paths. Um, so we've got Heathrow, City Airport and Gatwick all go over us. In a number of areas, uh, the, the noise level was illegal and this was not monitored and not found. So uh, we held an event where a local expert talked us through this and how obviously um, air travel is extremely high carbon, <laughs> extremely high carbon. Um, it would be better to not fly, but our problem here really is the noise of the flights, which is going up now. I don't know if you've noticed. And another thing we've done is uh, uh, online vegan cooking sessions. So people who might want to consider eating less meat, meat is very high carbon, uh, you can learn by following online instructions with a professional chef in real time, cook along and create vegan food for yourself. We called it Green Your Eats. 
And actually, we're thinking of starting a restaurant competition in Lewisham. So if you've got a favorite restaurant that does meat-free food, you can go online and nominate them for a prize. Coming soon. Um, uh, so, so coming back to this, how am I an experiment? Hmm, that's the question. <laughs> so, I'm a very ordinary individual, but I have human superpowers. I have powers of relationship. I have powers of compassion. I have powers of creativity. I have powers of empathy, powers of connectivity, powers of mm, creativity and generativity. In other words, I'm a completely normal person. These are completely normal human capacities of the sophistication of the human species, ultimately, that allow us to create change in our own context with our friends, with our school relationships, with our streets, uh, with our colleagues, with whoever we have contact with. We can spread ideas. We can show them how to live a zero carbon life. And what I've been doing is using myself as a tool in that I have a normal load of uh, social and community contacts. And through those contacts, I try, try to spread practice and I support and work with others to try and do the same thing. Now, what I'm really doing is pushing the boundaries of completely unaccountable, unelected, unpaid, and mm, unmarshaled mm, personal and community power, otherwise known maybe as empowerment, and coming from a position of love for the planet. Oh, here I am, with a big tree. <laughs> so, we have a massive global problem which is about, ultimately, people power and social change. What we need to do as a society, as a, as a species, is we need to take ourselves apart, culture by culture, notion by notion, value by value, mm, practice by practice, idea by idea, and kind of pick ourselves apart, sinew by sinew, cell by cell, down to the state of being humans, Humans are amazing, and we need to remake ourselves as the kind of people who can, who can cope, who can change, who can move forward, who can live in a different way on a beautiful planet and inhabit it and deserve a place in a biological future on our planet. Thank you very much. Woo!